I'm very honored to present today um, my experience with FredX. So far, I used 18 um, in 18 patients for FredX. Uh, most of the aneurysms, as you can see, um, segment some PCOM aneurysms, um, some superior hypophyseal or dorsal or ventral wall ICA aneurysms, so all paraclinoid. Um, and I just want to highlight to show you what type of devices I use. This this kind of shows already um, kind of the trend. So most of the time, I'm 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 usually a flow diverter user who tries to be pretty precise and short. I usually don't don't use a long device. Um, and I think the FRED really offers you that um, that really the precision um, of deployment because it doesn't really foreshorten once it's deployed. It's, it really stays in place. And you can see that that in five cases, I for example, I used only a 13 length. Here another 13 length. Here's a 17. I used in, in some cases were a little bit. Um, uh, where multiple aneurysms are maybe um, in that segment, um, I used uh, a little bit of a longer devices. And, um, if you look at my follow up results so far, I did 10 follow ups out of the 18 cases. Um, in all of the cases so far, I didn't see any movement of the device exactly in that position where I deployed it. So that's good news. And um, out of the 10, I had six complete occlusion at six months. Um, three over 75 occlusion and one under 50% occlusion. So um, a near occlusion rate of 90% in these 10 cases, so really good. And um, I didn't see any stenosis in nine of the cases. In one, I saw some narrowing, which we sometimes see like an intima hyperplasia. But um, in most of the cases, you can see 90%. There was no issue at six months. Um, thromboembolic complications, I had none during the procedure. There was one lady who had um, a few weeks after starting to have TIA episodes, which then um, stopped under, um, under checking the dual antiplatelet regimen. She was actually um, responding and, and it stopped then, but um, that was kind of like a delayed issue. Um, not 100% not sure to what it was related, but definitely not like during the procedure. Um, and so, what does that mean for me? So what is my change then in regimen? So I always do six months follow up for my flow diverter. And here for, for these patients who, are, who have a completed um, aneurysm, completely occluded aneurysm, um, I usually do follow up imaging just an MRA in two years. If there's any incomplete occlusion, I've, I repeat a DSA in six months. Um, and if the aneurysm is occluded, most of these cases I, I, I go down to baby aspirin and discontinue. But this this, the change of dual antiplatelets is, is more important for this portion here. So if there's no if there's no stenosis, but aneurysm is still filling, I still go down to um, baby aspirin. And if there's no stenosis, MRA in two years. And if um, in this case where it's mild stenosis, obviously I continue then the dual antiplatelets and I'm, um, I'm repeating the DSA in six months. So, um, so that's kind of my my way uh, of thinking with these flow diverters. But most of the time, as you can see, after six months, if the stand looks okay, I discontinue the dual antiplatelets to baby aspirin, and um, and then repeat imaging based on the occlusion st status of the aneurysm. So if it's completely occluded, I just go with MRA, and then I'm pretty confident, just saying in two years or even longer. If it's not occluded at that point, I I repeat a, an angiogram at six months. OK, let me show you a few cases. I think some of them uh, um, you have seen before, but um, so this is um, my first FedEx case, a 50 year old patient um, with a five millimeter ruptured right uh, um, PCOM aneurysm, which I called initially and had a small recurrence. Um, and there was an additional anterior choroidal aneurysm. So I think that's a good um, case for delayed flow diversion. Um, the proximal diameter of the vessel was 3.6 and the distal um, 3.5. Um, so here in this case, we um, we decided to um, to really land the device here in the ICA terminus because we wanted to cover both aneurysms, but I didn't want to jail the, um, the A1. But you can see um, that I also didn't really want to land it right here in, in the ICA terminus to be not too close to the aneurysm neck. So I wanted to here actually starting with the stent portion, not flow diverting portion precisely here in the M1, um, but uh, let allow the portion of non flow diverting to, to really um, allow flow in the A1. Um, so these are the first 
first to start fluoro. So it, I just want to show you how precise you can be with the device. So this is the initial opening. And then here um, in the next video, you can see how I'm actually going to change the position to come even more proximal to really land it exactly in that area where I wanted to land it. And um, once I had it positioned here, I started to um, to unsheath mainly the device with some form of tension and and this is the portion of um, the 50 50 rule where 50 percent of all of the um, the flow diverter is deployed and you can see here um, the device will land here right before the autonomic artery in this in this area um, as I mentioned the vessel size was about 3.5 so we went with a four device but we, we went pretty short because we didn't want to go around additional bands. We just wanted to, to stay in a very short segment. So this is the unsheathing and the final deployment, as you can see here. Um, she does one more view. Since it was the first case, we stored a lot of fluoros, and you can see here how nicely it deployed on the lateral here and also on the AP. So it's really important here. In this case, we had no intermediate catheter, although it was the first case. Um, we just used the headway 27. Obviously, an intermediate catheter is, um, is, is usually recommended for the first couple of cases. And you can see this is the final result. So, so perfectly landed where we want it to be. Um, so um, the flow is still going into the A1 without um, compromising the, without having the flow diverting portions in that area, but covering also both aneurysms. And, um, we saw significant stasis in the end risk. Um, so I did a six month follow up on this. You can see here, this is the six month follow up, how nicely the device is open. So there's no narrowing of the device, no movement. Um, the aneurysm is still filling a, <laughs> a little bit. As you can see here, the anterior choroidal aneurysm is gone um, here. But um, overall, that's I think that was a great result for six months. So here, um, it discontinued the aspirin, uh, the, the plavix, the plavix that switched to baby aspirin, and we're going to repeat an angio to, to make sure that this occludes. Um, that's a third case. Um, that's that's a pretty pretty um, um, a significant tortuosity in the anatomy, as you can see here, but also multiple aneurysms coming off the, the supraclinoid ICA. It's really hard to define what that actually is. Most likely a PCOM aneurysm, a choroidal, and then also an ophthalmic aneurysm. So here in this scenario, we, we definitely had to go longer to cover all of them. And um, you see here that these are the measurements, 4.1, 4.3, patient with significant um, aneurysm history bilateral, and that was a, she was lost of follow-up, and, and that's what we found on follow-up. So she definitely needed treatment. Um, so here, similar idea, the, the goal was really to land it in the ICA terminus. So sometimes as here, I, I, start, I still start in the... Um, M1, as you can see here, the video, and let it deploy the device. And I'm not a fan of dragging the device, but just a tiny bit. And you can see how it now, in a second, it will orient. It. The more I unsheet the device, now it will really lock into that position in the ICA terminus. And, and that's exactly the perfect position where we wanted to have the device. Um, because here, we're really not jailing the A1 and the M1. And you can see how nicely it opened. and um, and this was the final picture, as you can see, significant stasis in, in the large PCOM aneurysm here and wide open stand, wide open distal and proximal vessels. And here actually we treated the other side two months later. So I have like a very early follow up on this patient, as you can see in two months follow up. And, and here surprisingly already here, despite being on dual antiplatelets, the, these two aneurysms are gone. The timing aneurysm is still here, but you can see how nicely um, um, the vessel is remodeled and the aneurysms, um, most of them are already occluded at two months. Um, this is a fourth patient, um, a 61 year old patient with an unruptured uh, PCOM aneurysm, also a family history of um, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, very favorable anatomy for flow diversion, as you can see here. Um, small vessel size 3.2, so here we used, um, um, but up here. Um, it, it went up to almost 3.5. So here we actually decided to go with like a four device, 413.7. Similar to the first case, I showed you um, the deployment in the ICA terminus. Um, and I recently did a six month follow up, as you can see here, with 
wide open stand um, occlusion of the aneurysm completely, as you can see here, in comparison to before. So that was the aneurysm here, and now it's completely gone at six months. So this is a great case because here we can go to baby aspirin and then just an MRA in two years. So we, I wouldn't repeat an angiogram here six months later. Um, this is um, another patient, a 43 year old patient with a large um, um, superior hypophysial aneurysm. Um, the, you can see um, significant mismatch from 4.15 in the proximal ICA, which is usually the case at distal 3.2. So we went with a uh, 4.5 device here, um, also triaxial. Um, these were the pictures through the Sophia. Um, and here I want to highlight, so usually I, I still bring my um, Headway 27 into the M1. Um, and the advantage here really, just to highlight this also compared to pipeline or surpass, you don't really have to open the device in the M1, right? You don't have you don't have the sleeves where you don't have to um, open the device. So you can really deploy it in the position where you want to deploy it. So it's a huge, huge um, advantage compared to other flow diverters. But I still like to have the distal portion of the microcatheter first in the M1 to really bring the device up and stabilize everything. But um, here in this scenario, you can see that I came back a little bit with my um, with my microcatheter when we um, when we lower the device. But you can see that um, how responsive the devices you can use. It's obviously not recommended, but you can see that it's possible that you can use the distal wire of the device to really navigate your catheter back into the M1. Um, so my feeling is really it's um, it's you have a very stable position with your microcatheter and the device inside. Um, it's it's much less um, forceful than with other flow diverters. It's it it really feels um, uh, much easier to push the device out. And here you can see now the the deployment with the forward tension and then mainly unsheathing as you can as as discussed before. And then um, that's the final deployment coming around the bend. And the visibility is really nice, um, especially also with the obviously the new machines, but um, the dual layer design of the device really helps us to really see that the device is also open. Um, and that's the deployment, the final deployment. There was a little bit of tension, but but the, the device deployed nicely. The distal end, the proximal end. And, and that was the final result with significant stasis in the aneurysm, as you can see here. So these are the cases I, I wanted to show, and I'm happy to, um, to, dis to discuss or answer any questions. Um, for me, really, the Fredex is a promising new flow diverter, and for me, it can, it can really tailor your, your daily flow diverting um, business because it really the anchoring techniques within the bifurcation um, where you can really use the the flared non-flow diverting ends is really unique. No other flow diverter can do that. And and for me, it's really important indication and sizing. Um, I would definitely start in the beginning with uh, anatomy, which is more straightforward to get used to the deployment because it is different uh, than other flow diverters and then slowly work your way into more complex anatomy. Um, and for me, really dual antiplatelet uh, regimen is very important, especially the PIU testing is, is super important. Um, okay, thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to answer any questions.